You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Hello and welcome to Urgent Questions, the special edition of the Parliament Matters podcast where we try and answer your questions about the inner workings, the inner mysteries of the Commons and the Lords and Westminster itself. I'm Mark Darcy. And I'm Ruth Fox. So Ruth, what do we got? So our first question, Mark, is, uh, well, he doesn't give his or her name. It's disappointed but not surprised of Sheffield. <laughs> um, and uh, and disappointed but not surprised has, has said... At the end of January, there was an e-petition that was debated calling for uh, uh, an early general election. Got up over 100,000 signatures in order to get a debate. Very few people in the chamber. Um, ended in less than an hour. Um, and basically, um, our questioner is asking, in the words of Homer Simpson, do what exactly has that petition achieved? So I think the least likely outcome of all this was going to be that um, the minister would get up at the end of the debate and say, yeah, it's a fair cop, the Prime Minister's on his way to the palace to get an election called right now. That was never going to happen. I think the Petitions Committee and the whole petitions process is at its most effective when it's raising an issue where something is actually possible to be done. In, in this case, the government's going to call an election at what it conceives to be the most advantageous moment, mm. uh, that's it. But when you're talking about other things, when you're talking about the cost of parking at hospitals, which is a huge issue for sort of repeat visitors who often face quite significant bills for their visits, when you're talking about things like the infected blood scandal, when you're trying to sort of galvanise some cause into a bit more action, that's where the petitions process really comes into play. Not least because MPs know that the petitions debates are, after PMQs, pretty much the most watched parliamentary event online, often driven by these sort of hashtag media campaigns, and that they know that there's um, some glory to be had. I can imagine that the chamber was empty on this occasion, because there wasn't any any great no. glory to be had because this was a very sort of symbolic debate that they kind of had to do because the number of signatures had passed the threshold of 100,000. Yeah, and they knew what the answer from the minister was going to be. No, you're not having an election early. <laughs> uh, that's it. <laughs> the prime minister will decide when he's good and ready. Um, so our next questions, um, they're also anonymous, um, but they're related. So we've discussed prime minister's questions uh, recently on the last couple of episodes and we've, we've got questions about PMQs. So first questioner says... Was there ever a time when the Prime Minister of the day actually gave a proper answer? It's deviated from an actual Q&A. And why don't the questioners object to not receiving an answer? Um, and why doesn't the Speaker you know, have any power or influence in this charade? Oh, gosh. Well, there are quite a lot of answers to that. The first is... Um... Last year sometime, I listened to a very rare recording of a Prime Minister's Question Time with Harold Wilson in it, uh, which was done during a a brief experiment with broadcasting live the proceedings of the Commons in the mid-70s. And it was a much more staid, much more formal, Mm. mannered affair than Prime Minister's Questions has subsequently become. It's evolved since then into this kind of gladiatorial combat where the Prime Minister is fending off the opposition leader and and it's all very high temperature and the baying and roaring is always there. And maybe that's partly a product of when Prime Minister's Question Time stopped being a quarter of an hour on a Tuesday and a quarter of an hour mm. on a Thursday and became half an hour on a Wednesday. It became the kind of peak moment of the week and maybe that stoked up the temperature in it. So that's the kind of course of, over which it's evolved in the last couple of decades. Um, powers of the Speaker? The Speaker can't be the arbiter of fact, The Speaker can't be there suddenly getting up and saying, no, that answer's wrong, uh, because no one's infallible. He's quite just as likely as anybody else to get stuff wrong if if that happens. The Speaker can only really call out misbehaviour in the chamber. So people who are shouting or gesturing or being rude or disrupting proceedings in some way, the Speaker can deal with that, but he's never going to be a sort of quiz master uh, giving uh, marks out of 10 for the correctness of the answers. That would be a very dangerous thing for Mm. him to become. I've always thought uh, if I were um, the leader of the opposition, an unlikely proposition, I grant you, 
But if um, if I was getting sort of some of the, the answers that you get from the Prime Minister, I've often thought I'd, I'd quite like to do the sort of slam my papers down on the dispatch box, walk out of the chamber, tell the Speaker I've had enough of this, um, and sort of walk <laughs> out into, you know, sort of outside on the Palace Estate, media press conference, and, and, and basically say, I'm not doing this anymore because it's a waste of everybody's time. See what kind of reaction you get. <laughs> well, well it, it is a charade. I, I, I said a couple of pods ago that, you know, Every time I watch PMQs, a little part of my soul seems to yeah. wither and die. Well, I'd love to know what the clerks sat at the table were thinking <laughs> when they, they have to endure this every week. And they have to be, you know, completely straight faced. Um, they never they never give anything away. But I often do wonder what are they, what are they thinking uh, well, about it all. It, it is that one thing that does slightly surprise me doesn't happen more often. I mean, the, 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 there have to be half the questions from the opposition and half the questions from the government side. So why aren't more opposition MPs lined up with the option of being able to say, when my honourable friend, the leader of the opposition, asked this question, the Prime Minister didn't reply. I would like to give him another chance to actually <laughs> fit, you know, properly answer this very important question. Yeah, if you get that happening two or three times, it kind of hammers home the point that an issue has been dodged yeah. or answered with some form of words that's so vague that it doesn't really take you anywhere. So there is that option for follow-up. But again, that turns the thing into something that's even more orchestrated than it already is. Yeah. Yeah. And our second sort of related question is is around the that question of the power of the speakers. If he actually did send somebody out for his much vaunted cup of tea, threw them out of the chamber. I mean, how does it work? What's what's the process? Well, there's the there's the formal process of naming where someone's behaved particularly badly, where the speaker says, I name Mr. Such and such, such and mm. such. And then the chief whip is supposed to get up and immediately move a motion that they be excluded from the chamber. Sometimes the Speaker will just order someone out and they'll go. Yeah. If they refuse to go, then you get the process of naming, at, at, at which point, if necessary, they'd be frog-marched out by the, by the ushers, I suppose. Yeah, the Sergeant at Arms with his, uh, with his, with his sword, sword by his side. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, in, if things were to deteriorate considerably, the Speaker can also, of course, suspend and adjourn the sitting. Uh, grave disorder having broken out, I yeah. think is the phrase. And then uh, and he just suspend the thing and do... And, and you sometimes wonder if it gets particularly silly, whether that might be quite a salutary lesson. I've had enough of this. Mm, yeah. uh, if, if they can't grow up. I'm going to stop the proceeding altogether. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be quite a thing for a speaker to do. Yes, it would. So our next question is from Don Frampton. Is the practice of parliamentary whips, so this concept of one, two or even three line whips, resulting in MPs being known as no more than lobby fodder, is it in the best interest of democratic government? We should probably explain the, the, the nature yeah. of one and two and three line whips. A, a, a one-line whip is there's going to be a vote. It's probably a pretty formal rubber stamping of something that no one really disagrees on very much. Uh, and if you fancy voting for it, fair enough. You don't uh, need to be there. Two-line two, two line whip is when the government just wants to make sure it's got enough warm bodies to, to, get, <laughs> to, to, to win the vote. Three-line whip, there's no pairing. There's no sort of arrangements you can make with the other side that someone else is, isn't there because you're not going to be there. Uh, to sort of balance out your absence. Uh, three-line whip is the full array of... Three-line whip is the full array of parliamentary um, forces lined against each other, no exceptions, pretty yeah. much. You must be there. You in, must be in, there. Your the presence house. is required, or yeah. some such phrase yeah. is used on the document MPs are given, telling yeah. them what votes are, are expected. And, of course, these days that's backed up with text messages and things. Come on in, there's, a, there's going to be a vote suddenly. Uh, and, and people whistle them up. Every now and then, um, the government's caught on the hop and uh, has to sort of rather scrabble around to make sure it's got the people in place to, to, mm. to, to win a particular vote. And when it's a three-line whip, you sometimes see them sort of calling back ministers from overseas visits, select committees from overseas visits to make sure that they've, they've, they've got everybody in the precincts of the palace so that they've got, was it seven, eight minutes to vote? Yeah, and there's a process of nodding through where someone, if they're on the precincts of the palace, in a stretcher even can be considered to have voted. Mm. And there was a very famous occasion in, 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 I think, the 1970s when there was a question about whether someone was really there or not or whether the government whips of the time had pulled a fast one and pretended they were present when they weren't in order to avoid a defeat of the government. But in general, um, the whips try not to gain these votes because if they do, you know, that way madness lies. The whole system can grind to a yeah. halt. And indeed, in the 70s, it did for a while because there was a, 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 the opposition um, stopped cooperating 
uh, in in the conduct of votes and everyone had to be there all the time for every vote and, and that caused some pretty chaotic results. But this this question about whether it's in the best interest of democratic government, um, I mean, in the 1950s, you know, you would have, you know, entire sessions uh, where you wouldn't get, for example, backbench rebellions on, on, on votes. Um, you don't see that now. You, you, it is a, a more rebellious uh, legislature than, than, than it was in decades past. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it, it's... It's important, I think, for to be able to govern that there's some coherence and some some consistency. Um, and if all your MPs can do whatever they like when they like, um, that chaos lies in, yeah, in that a, direction. A, absolutely, the, a coherent party system is necessary for the process of also orderly government. And and this is where you get to the difficulty of MPs deciding that they're going to just sort of make up their own mind completely independently on every question. Mm. Um, it suddenly starts to look a bit more like the U.S. Congress, where you know the process of sort of pork barrel politics and then uh, Congress persons having to be in effect sort of bribed with goodies for their constituency in order to vote for a a, uh, a certain proposition. That kind of thing can happen. I mean, it did happen to an extent here. I had a theory that uh, during the latter days of Theresa May, when she didn't have a majority, every time there was a tight vote in the House of Commons, uh, she needed the support of the Northern Ireland DUP. So every time things got difficult another small town in Northern Ireland got a bypass or something <laughs> um, so it, it does happen a bit in, in this country and, and maybe a slightly more open system where MPs were a bit more willing to go off piece might mean that they were able to get more goodies for their constituency yeah, yeah. from time to time which I think happens informally a bit at the moment yeah. but at the same time you know, government could be, would become tremendously incoherent if every vote was an open mm. vote where almost anything could happen. Yeah, and it's also important to remember on things like legislation, you can have you know a run of, of multiple votes uh, each evening and on very, very technical amendments. Um, and for example, if you're a minister or you know, you've know you been on a select committee um, and you're suddenly sort of pulled into the to the chamber, you've got you've got to vote. Are you on top of every the, the dot and comma of every amendment that Almost you're voting on? Not. No, um, and that's where the whip is the guidance. You know, this is the agreed party line, and you should be supporting. So it should be supporting this. Yeah, and when you buy into a political party it's very likely that you don't believe in every dot and comma of their policy platform. You're buying a package deal. Yeah. Yeah, and just as if you go on a holiday, you may not want to go on the on, on the guided tour part of the trip, and you may prefer to stay in the bar at the hotel or whatever. <laughs> you know, sometimes there are things that you don't necessarily buy into, but you're kind of stuck with because it's part of the package. And if you start rejecting large chunks of the package, maybe people start concluding you shouldn't have gone on the holiday at all. Yeah, I mean that that's you know, the essence of parliamentary democracy, isn't it? That yeah. ultimately there has to be compromise because not everybody can have everything they want all the time. Although some of them would really like that. Indeed. Well, we've got a question here from Ollie Day. Sinn Féin MPs, of course, don't take their seats in Parliament. However, they are able to have offices in Westminster. Would you be able to provide an explanation of any of the differences in the way in which their office operation is funded compared to those of other MPs? Yeah, so I, I owe Ollie an apology for this because this has been hanging around for a few weeks, took a bit of research, so had to look into this one. Um, so, uh, so Ollie, the, the answer is, um, well, as many of our listeners will know, Sinn, Sinn Féin MPs don't take their seats in the House of Commons, so they have what's a policy that they call abstentionism. Um, they don't take their seats, they don't vote. Um, MPs are required by law after the election to take an oath of allegiance or to solemnly affirm uh, their allegiance to the monarch in, in order to take their seats, in order to vote, in order to get their salary. Um, Sinn Féin, of course, refused to do this. So they don't receive parliamentary salaries. Um, it's said that Sinn Féin, the party, pays them a salary, believed to be something like they, they refer to it as the, an annual industrial average wage. Um, they do, however, receive money for expenses. So they get office costs and travel costs. Um, they have to maintain a register of interests. 
in relation to those forms of expenditure, but not in relation to the salaries, because that's been paid by, by the party. So there's some criticism that there's a lack of transparency there. So what they can do with all this is that they can do the MP role of raising issues with ministers on behalf of their constituents, keep yeah. up the correspondence, They that do the constituency element, but not the Westminster Parliament mm. element. But they do travel to Westminster for, for meetings. And and you occasionally see seen about there. the place, yeah. yes. I mean, there, was a, there was a point during the, the Brexit uh, Fandango after the hung parliament of the 2017 election, uh, where people kept suggesting, well, if the Sinn Feiners came into Westminster, they could tip the balance, and, <laughs> but they never did. No. And, the, and the taboo here of not taking part in in, of institutions of the British state is so great that it's very hard to imagine that Sinn Féin yeah, would ever break no, no, it, no. however big the sort of potential yeah. political results might be in yeah. Britain. Um, the party also, so Sinn Féin also receives some public money for party business. So parties in, in Parliament get what's called short money uh, in opposition to support their activities. Named after Ted Short, Labour deputy leader in the early 70s. There you go. Um, they don't get that. They get what's called representative money. So short money is not available to, 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 to members who haven't sworn the oath and don't take part in proceedings. So... Apparently in 2006, the House of Commons agreed to create a similar scheme for an opposition party represented by members who have chosen not to take their seats, which basically was for Sinn Féin. Um, so they can claim costs for sort of expenses incurred in relation to employment of, of staff, related support for the, for the, for the members, um, you know, support for party spokespersons and so on. Um, the argument is that they're elected on a mandate not to take their seats, that they are very clear to the electorate, we're not going to take our seats, the electorate know that, they go ahead and vote for them. So um, they're still providing sort of active support for their constituents, they're still you know, pr doing other forms of party and parliamentary business. Um, Sinn Féin, I think, got in the last financial, well, in this financial year, I think it's £189,000 for the main costs and about just under £5,000 for travel costs. So um, comparatively not huge, but still, you know, a reasonable sum. Um, there's calls for this to be reviewed. I mean, the, the Democratic Unionist Party don't like it. Um, and, in a shock uh, discovery. <laughs> yes. They, they are often um, calling it for it to be reviewed. But um, at the moment, that's, that's the situation. OK, here's, here's another one. Do all ex-members of Parliament have access to the parliamentary estate? Why are so many allowed back with a pass? Anonymous again, that questioner. Yeah. So, um, again, uh, this one we've held over a bit because I had to, had to look it up. Um, not all of them, for a start. No, not, not all. And, and there's been a bit of a crackdown on security passes mm. in recent years. Um, so fewer than uh, was, was the case in the past. So an MP can sponsor four staff members and a family member, so that, that's the number of passes that they can have. And for former MPs, if you have served a minimum of six years or two full parliamentary terms, whichever is the longer, you're entitled to a former MP's pass. So an MP who is uh, in, in there from so 2017 to 2019 wouldn't automatically wouldn't, no, qualify? no. Um, and um, the Standards and the Privileges Committee can recommend that an MP who's left the House uh, can lose their pass as a sanction. Yes, and John Burko is the most prominent yep. example of someone who's had a sort of never darken our door again order yep. against them. I can't remember whether Boris Johnson, whether he's, he's going to be stripped of his pass. I think he, I think he has been. I think he has been, but there is the difficulty there that were you to get re-elected yeah. um, in, the, in the knowledge that this was the case, the electorate would have spoken. So if he had, yep. for example, stood in the Uxbridge by-election after the recall petition yep. uh, and been re-elected... Yep. Uh, I, th I think the parliamentary authorities would just have, had, uh, have to sort of swallow that particular mm. wasp and let him back in yeah. because the voters would have spoken. Yeah, but, um, but I mean, he, he, he qualifies as a former MP who served a minimum of six years or two full parliamentary terms. He qualifies on that, but I, th I think he may have I think lost his right, rights yeah. to a, a pass. Um, there's a lot of concern about the number of, of former MPs using the pass. I mean, the, the, the big issue is how many of them are using it for lobbying, because yeah. a lot of them do sign up for, for lobbying com companies. Some of them run their own consultancies, and that this gives them privileged access. So that's that's the big criticism. Um, and you could just mill around in Port Cullis House talking to people at the coffee bar, flourishing yeah. your pass and, and drinking parliamentary lattes yeah. uh, with the chaps and... Uh, yeah. and 
push whatever it is that you're yep. lobbying for. Yeah, and and you know, no doubt we're going to see this issue become uh, a, a concern again after the the next election when you're going to have a whole new set of MPs who, who some of whom will qualify under this minimum of six years or two full parliamentary terms and and, and can keep a pass. That'll be another one to keep an eye on. Uh, what are the faci- and another anonymous question here? What are the hospitality facilities in Parliament like, and what are they for? Usually, the info online is surrounded by furious opinions that cloud the truth. <laughs> hmm. um, well, uh, <laughs> I don't really think much of the hospitality facilities. I have to say. I mean, I think they're sort of faded, <laughs> faded glory is my my sort of view. I mean, um, you've got you've got. Coffee shops, Portcullis House. There's a coffee you've shop, there's a canteen, seen. there's a full dress restaurant in yeah. Portcullis House. Which are all fine. And then there's the, uh, there are various other canteens about the estate. There are also a couple of restaurants yeah. of varying degrees of grandeur. And there are also members only facilities yeah. where they can be untroubled by yeah. journalists and staffers and so forth because it's members only. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a whole different variety of them. And, and a lot of this goes back to the kind of 19th century gentleman's club yes. ambiance. It has that feel of it. You know, and uh, not not least in the menu, which uh, um, perhaps it's a bit less traditional than it used to be now. But I, I kind of imagine it being at least sort of spiritually sort of beef beef um, steak and then spotted dick for dessert. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been gone a bit, a bit more a bit, modern than that. Got a bit more days. modern these days. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, personally, uh, one of the one of the the, the issues if if you are booking an event. Uh, so you're sort of, you know, booking one of the banqueting facilities as a private organisation. It is pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and frankly, I think the food and drink is not that great quality for the price, would mm-hmm. be my, would my view. But that's, but that's quite a personal view. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm one of these people... You obviously who, did, did have you, a different view. I'm a complete canopy hound, I'm afraid. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you, know, you take me to one of these events and I, I, I'll be perfectly happy for hours. Eat but your way around the room. Yeah, you, abso- yeah, absolutely. But, you know, the, part of this is that there is a, a sort of semi-social side to politics. The, there are groups who hold receptions to publicise a cause and you come there and there'll be, you know, glasses of Aussie Chardonnay available uh, and maybe some sort of volivants with a bit of stuff inside them uh, and also there's the other side of it is when an MP is receiving a sort of delegation of people from their constituency the drill is that they probably take them in and buy them all a cup of coffee now you're doing that you know buying coffee for eight or nine people four or five times a week that, that mm. sort of mounts up to mm. quite a lot of money and that's one of the arguments behind well let's subsidize this a bit mm. and they are a bit subsidized they're not nearly as subsidized as they used to be and you go around parliament and there used to be little notices saying our prices have gone up because mm. we're not subsidizing it as much anymore I mean it's worth stressing that these faci- most of these facilities are used by not just MPs and peers but parliamentary staff uh, the MPs own staff you know, journalists Jur- like yourself journalists. in the lobby, visitors like myself. Um, you know, they are they are open to people who are on the estate, and they are feeding thousands of people, not just six hundred and fifty yeah. MPs. It's a massive, massive yeah. operation. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how many thousands per week are going through, but it, it's it's very big numbers. Um, and there's no doubt if you if you get an opportunity to sit out on the terrace of the Commons and the Lords and look out over the Thames, particularly in the summer, on it a is, nice day, it's on fabulous. a nice day, it's fabulous. It's you know, and they say it's the you know one of the best views in London, um, and 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 it, it's tremendous. Um, the other side of it, though, is that you know, linked. We've had discussions in past episodes about restoration and renewal of the palace. You know, I not that long ago sat in a meeting in one of the uh, tea rooms in the in the Commons, and had three mice running around my feet, <laughs> which rather takes the the gloss takes, off. Things. Takes the edge off. I mean, certainly yeah. in, in the older part of the building, in particular, you do occasionally see mice, and you certainly see those little boxes of sort of poison intended yeah. to eliminate them. And you do also see them in the more modern areas, like Portcullis House. I can remember mm. seeing the little brown blobs scuffling across <laughs> the dining floor one day. I yeah. mean, it just wouldn't get away with this in health and safety terms yeah. in other in But, other of places, course, but Parliament is exempt. Yeah. Um, I, but I was learning this week in one of the newspapers that um, increasingly the rodents are resistant to the rodenticide. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a great problem. That's a political metaphor struggling to get yeah. out of that. But the, the one big problem the palace has is it hasn't got a really good conference facility. 
the biggest room on the estate really is the Atley suite in Portcullis House, which is the modern sort of office building uh, across from the palace. And that only holds about 120 people, something like that, maybe it's, 150. It's not vast. And it's not it's not great as an event facility for external events. Um, and, um, I mean, just as an example, when the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly um, held its... So this is the UK-EU body... Um, that was set up as part of the, the sort of agreements with the EU uh, at the end of the Brexit process, it meets a couple of times a year, sometimes in Brussels, sometimes in London. When it meets in London, as it did just before Christmas, it met in one of the committee rooms, and you know they were freezing. They were sat in their coats and hats because the heating wasn't on properly, the windows didn't shut properly, um, and that's the kind of thing where you think, actually, there ought to be yeah, it's, it's better facilities for this kind of thing. It's internationally embarrassing. It's getting a bit embarrassing. On to the next one, then, another anonymous question. What is the capacity of Parliament currently that would need to be supported if they were to vacate the Palace of Westminster for repairs? Stuff like offices, staff, dining rooms, bars, press galleries, meeting rooms, committee rooms, etc. Very big. Uh, a very great deal of facilities would have to be recreated somewhere else to keep Parliament operating because there's a whole sort of flying circus around those two chambers with the actual legislators in them that would need to keep going to sort of sustain democracy and make sure it was still reported. Yeah, whether you quite need to replicate everything and you certainly don't necessarily need to replicate it all in the same way and there are ways of doing things creatively, differently, you know, adapting procedures using technology perhaps for some of these these things but it would be a big operation you need a big footprint and that's been the big challenge with the restoration and renewal process deciding where could you decant one or both houses to I love this I love this word decant, decant. you know the MPs and peers would be decanted from Westminster like a fine, <laughs> fine <wine>. port you <laughs> know <laughs> leaving a bit of a residue at the bottom perhaps but uh, um so the two options that they came up with were Richmond House, which is the old Department of Health building on, on Whitehall, yeah. uh, where the Commons would, the plan was for the Commons to go, and the QE2 Conference Centre for the House of Lords. Mm. Now, the Richmond House would have accommodated the, the Commons Chamber, it would have accommodated you know, committee rooms, it would have accommodated the press. There are issues about how you accommodate, I think, sort of, you know, things like the tours, visits by school children. Well, I can't and, and imagine people that. would be quite as keen to visit what's essentially a bog standard 80s office block uh, as they would be to see the sort of gothic glories yeah. of the Victorian Palace of Westminster. So uh, I, 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 I think you could probably bite the bullet and say fewer tours maybe, even yeah. though the, the prime reason to go there, I think, is, is to see yeah. democracy in action. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the reasons to have the locations close to the current palace is so that you could maintain the offices of quite a few of the MPs in Portcullis House, in the neighbouring Norman Shaw North building, um, so that you didn't have to decant them somewhere else as well. Mm. Because um, they, they wouldn't need to be fixed at the same time as the, the sort of iconic no. Gothic building. Yeah, so you know they could stay in situ in the offices. You'd have to move some of the offices out that are in the main palace, um, you'd have to, you know, the peers could maintain their offices, which are some of which are in the palace, so they'd have to move, but some of them are in neighbouring buildings across the road. But this is the problem. And the sort of the solution that the Jacob Rees Moggs of this world have proposed, you know, this idea that the MPs would stay on the estate while the work went on around them, and you'd have this sort of polythene bubble that would protect them all from. Asbestos. Sewage, asbestos, and and, and, and and you know all the work on the mechanical and electrical engineering work. Um, the, the idea that you know this would be possible, um, it, we would lose. I mean, there's questions about whether the press could have access because you mm. know the sort of the worked up proposals suggest that it wouldn't accommodate much, if anything, for the press. There'd be no public access. Um, no, you'd be watching on television, essentially. You yeah. wouldn't be in the chamber anymore. Yeah. And you miss a lot when you're not in the chamber. Yeah. You know, the TV feed is not as revealing as being able to sort of crane your neck over the press gallery and see who's scuffling around in the yes. background, who's talking to who. And you, know, you see the whites of their eyes, essentially. You get a much better sense of the mood of the house, that elusive yeah. part of parliamentary reporting, if you're actually in the room, far better than you do if you're relying on where the director is pointing the cameras at any given moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I once was invited in to watch PMQs in the Parliamentary Press Gallery, um, and it was fascinating. It was also fascinating what a different angle you get 
sat above the speaker's chair than you mm. get in the public gallery at the opposite end of the, mm. the, the, the chamber in it, terms it, of what you see and, and who's talking to who. And it's a quite different experience. Yeah, yeah uh, it's it absolutely clear. And, and that's part of the reporting of Parliament that it may sound like I'm, I'm fussing here and this is just sort of privilege, but getting a sense of the mood, watching the background action mm. is critical to reporting accurately what's actually happening yep. in a legislature. And it can't be done just by watching it on telly. It, no. it really, really can't. Because I, I know that because I spent you know, the whole period of the pandemic watching Parliament down the line, didn't go into the chamber for ages. And it's a totally different, much more limiting experience. Yeah. So you know that that is the challenge. Um, it, it is a it is a huge operation. Um, thousands of people involved. Um, you know you've got this combination of of, of parliamentarians, staff. Uh, you know, catering staff, security staff. Mm. You've got the journalists. You've got the public. You've got the the you know the school visits. How do you accommodate all of that in a way that? provides a, a decent level of access, transparency, accountability, um, uh, whilst uh, ensuring the proceedings can, can, can continue. And, and the other critical point that you always need to remember is that it's really incredibly important that Parliament is immediately next door to government. Yes. That ministers can be whistled up to appear in the House if there's a crisis in moments, rather than having to take, you know, sort of hop on the underground or possibly the intercity train in order to get to wherever Parliament happens to be sitting. And this is, for my mind, the great flaw in the idea that Parliament could be relocated somewhere entirely different outside London. Only if you're going to take the government with it, in my yeah. view, yeah. because otherwise you are taking Parliament and government apart, and they need to be together. Yeah. Government I mean, needs to be able to listen to Parliament. Parliament needs to be able to listen to government. Yeah, they're fused. Um, yeah. You know, the, 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 the government exists if it commands the confidence of the House of Commons. Ministers have to be present. They have to be available when, you know, min, M, MPs want them to answer questions. Um, they have to be available at speed in the event of an emergency or a yeah, crisis. Absolutely. And so you don't want to sort of in, in, interpose a sort of three-hour journey on a train to take them yeah. up to, I don't know, York or wherever mm. it might be. And so that part of the... Because uh, you, you often get this, why can't we just move the whole thing somewhere else? You're not talking about just moving 600 people, which is no. a big enough undertaking on its own. There's a vast amount around it. And then you, if, if you're moving it and not all the civil servants and the ministries and the policy core of government alongside it, then you're making it far less effective. And I go back to the sort of points I was making just now about the virtual parliament. If, yeah. you, if, you, ha, if you break that umbilical cord between the two of them, you've got trouble. Yeah. And one of the things that you know, people like Professor Philip Norton, for example, often talk about is the importance of the informal private spaces of parliament and what goes on there in terms of the discussions and the negotiations between uh, in ministers and backbenchers, between people within parties, across party lines. All the kind of interactions that we were hearing about from James R. Buffnot when he was talking about the, the, the Post Office Horizon yeah. scandal, the chances to have consultations and quick words with ministers yeah. in the voting lobby, the chance to get groups of MPs and peers yeah. together to tackle the issue. Yeah. You know, that goes on behind the scenes that we don't see. You might have seen some of it, Mark, when you were, you know, a journalist and sort of stalking the corridors of the palace. But <laughs> but a lot of it's below the radar. A, a lot of it's below the radar, and um, but it is important. It's what <laughs> you know, it's a comfortable phrase. Greases the wheels of politics, mm. and um, it's as vital often as the very public stuff that we see in the chamber and in committees. Um, and if you separate the two, government and parliament, and put them in different locations, you lose that, and, and our politics would change considerably. Exactly so. Well, here's another one. Please could the pod talk about the right report? What were the recommendations? How much has been carried out? Are any political parties suggesting fuller implementation? I suppose we'd better start, really, with what the right report actually was. The Right Report was one of the things that came out of the great parliamentary expenses scandal in the 2008-2009 in the, uh, period when all these terrifying abuses of the MP's expenses system came to light. And, this is, and it's called the Right Report because it was to some extent the brainchild of Tony Wright, Labour MP, ex-minister, political scientist. And um, he wrote to Gordon Brown, then Prime Minister, saying that parliamentary reform was needed. 
and Gordon Brown put him in charge of a committee to look at reforms that could re-energise Parliament, rebuild its somewhat shattered credibility in the wake of the expenses scandal. And he came up with a number of recommendations, some of which have been uh, implemented and some of which haven't. But Ruth... Yeah, so I suppose there were three core recommendations that emerged from it. Um, Two concerned the management of parliamentary or House of Commons time, its agenda. Um, So a big concern, something we've we've talked about on previous episodes, is that the MPs don't control the agenda of the House of Commons, the government does. Um, Government business has precedence on the order paper. And there was a view that... Um, in order for MPs to have credibility, in order for MPs to exert themselves against the government, in order to hold the government effectively to account, um, they needed to control their own agenda. Um, And they needed to be able to say, we want more time on this bill, or we want to debate this on this particular day, or no, we don't think that's important, we want to debate X instead of Y, whatever it may be. Um, So there was a proposal to have a business committee, which was something that had been um, initially proposed by the Constitution Unit at University College London, I think, our colleague, um, Professor Meg Russell, um, who was actually an advisor to the the committee. And um, the the, the right committee recommended this. And it also had a, a, a parallel recommendation that there should be what was called a backbench business committee that um, backbenchers should have an opportunity to make representations to this committee for how a certain amount of time reserved uh, each session should be spent by backbenchers able to debate things that they wanted to, that they wanted to raise of concern. Yeah, and the, the Backbench Business Committee has had a, a, a quite an impact, actually, on, on the shape of the parliamentary week. Most weeks now, a Thursday afternoon, is taken up with two debates that have been nominated by the Backbench Business Committee on subjects raised by MPs. So the way it works is that there's a kind of dragon's den session of the Backbench Business Committee where a group of MPs will go along. And it has to be a cross-party group. Yeah. It can't just be one particular party pushing its pet causes. It has to be a cross-party alliance. And they will go along and they'll say, we think this is a terribly important issue and you should have a debate on it and we'd like prime time on the floor of the House. And, for example, it might be on the post office horizon system or it might be on um, some particular disease and the need to um, you know, do spend more money investigating a particular type of cancer or something like that. It, it might be any, anything under the sun, really, that a parliamentarian could be concerned about. And so you get these in there, and ministers have to give a response at the end of it. And that's the critical bit, in a way. Lots of MPs get together and say, we're concerned about this. What's the government doing? The minister gives an answer. MPs may be happy with the answer. Uh, nine times out of ten, they're not entirely happy with the answer. But it gets something onto the parliamentary agenda. Yeah. And when this was first implemented in the 2010 Parliament, I mean, the, um, the, the then Labour MP, Natasha Engel, uh, chaired it. And as you say, it's sort of like a dragon's den type uh, model where and, and MPs come along and, and make their case for why their, their she, she debate should be in, considered. She indeed invented that model. It didn't yeah. have to be that way, but that was the way she decided it would be with open bidding rather than some sort of behind-the-scenes, yeah. sub-usual channels, Wasn't secretive it, arrangement. George Young used to call it Natasha's Salon, <laughs> <laughs> where all, all the MPs used to have to turn up and make their case. Um, but... Um, And and I think in that first parliament, it had a big impact. It was a big change. There was a lot of interest, some some big debates. My sense is after the 2015 election, the government nobbled the elections to that committee a little bit. Mm. And um, and it was um, muted a little. It it settled down. I mean, it's very striking that the first backbench business committee was absolutely chock-a-block with hardcore conservative Eurosceptics, Peter Bone, Philip Hollobone, I think Christopher Chope off the top of my head, but a, a group of people there who were very, very much on the Brexiteer wing of the Conservative Party. And actually, they, they occasionally used their leverage on the Backbench Business Committee to get sort of Brexiteer points onto the floor of the House. And it was one of the things that helped lead to um, the the parliamentary manoeuvres that pushed David Cameron into conceding that Mm. there should indeed be a referendum on Britain's membership of the EU, with the consequences that we now see. So that change in structure was fantastically important there. But as you say, uh, in subsequent parliaments, there's a sense that it's kind of quietened down a bit. 
Um, uh, I mean, the faction that saw this as an opportunity uh, basically taught the government whips a bit of a lesson that they'd better keep an eye on how this operation was working and make sure that there was kind of a broad range of opinion on it. Yeah. Uh, and so, it, as you say, it's, it's calmed down a little since Yeah, and I think, I think successive parliaments since, it's not really taken off uh, and got the profile um, mm. and the types of debates that perhaps the advocates for the committee back in 2009-10 yeah. thought it uh, might. And they mostly don't lead to votes is the other no. thing. I mean, sometimes there are resolutions and sometimes those resolutions are a bit contentious and there is a vote, but most of the time it's more of a, an opportunity to air an issue. Yeah. Uh, and when it, when it holds debates, it also holds debates in Westminster Hall, there are never votes in Westminster Hall. So um, those, those debates are purely there to get sort of air the issue, get an answer from a Minister. So those are two of the recommendations. The House Business Committee, which hasn't happened, because I, th I think the David Cameron's go coalition government eventually sort of initially said it was committed to it, but somehow never got around to actually doing it, and then eventually backed away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Backbench Business Committee, which did happen. And the third big area that they dealt with was select committees. And yes. they made some very big changes there. Yes, yeah, so but the big change was the decision to that select committee chairs should be elected by the house um, and select committee members should be elected within the party groups so i think that has changed both the profile and the approach to the job that select committee chairs have taken um, and you know they have to get support for for their um, nomination not just from their own party but on a cross-party basis so they they are appealing to the house not just to their own particular party colleagues. Um, and that affects how they see their sort of their, their role and their accountability. Um, and it has strengthened them as, as in individual institutional actors within, well, well, within indeed, the House. I mean, the most visible sign of that is that usually when there's a, a uh, if there's a government statement on a particular issue, there'll be the, the government front bench will make the statement, the opposition will respond, the third party will get a word in, and the next person called is usually the chair of the select committee. It slightly depends where in the batting order they are, it depends on which party they're in, but the chair of the select committee is always called fairly early on those things if they're present. The other dynamic that this brings in is the way that MPs choose chairs of select committees. So what happens, first of all, is that the select committees are divvied up between the parties according to their strength in the Commons. So if, if a government's got 50% of, of the MPs, then it will get 50% of the chairs and it, there will be for particular committees. So you, you will know which party has to supply the chair for, say, the Home Affairs Committee. If you have a Conservative chairing a particular committee and you have maybe four Conservative, four or five Conservative MPs uh, all vying for that job, then actually the decisive factor is how the opposition parties vote. Yeah. And so what you tend to get is the opposition parties choosing the Conservative MP who they think is going to cause the government most trouble. <laughs> And similarly, when you've got a, uh, a Labour person or several Labour candidates, the, the government MPs will then, will then think, um, which is the most interesting, shall we say, Labour candidate to have chairing that particular committee. And so you, th there's quite a little dynamic there. And it has meant, if you like, the rise of the troublemakers mm. to some extent, the people who are going to have the most interesting things to do. So when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, uh, I suspect that a lot of Labour MPs thought that Jeremy Hunt chairing the Health Select Committee would be real trouble for Boris Johnson, so they voted for Jeremy Hunt. Bad of him. And you know, it's been a theme of the podcast, though, that Select Committees are struggling to, to get some, some of their seats filled. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, not chairs... But, but members. Um, and it's been a theme that, you know, <laughs> attendance is not what it was. So, again, I think the aspirations of the right committee back in 2009-10 in respect of committee chairs have probably been largely met. But I think in terms of the wider membership, there's a sort of been a falling off in recent years. Yeah. And that's a product of, you know, the pandemic parliament. It's been a pro product of uh, several, you know, quick general elections it's been a product of the you know ministerial turnover and so on there's lots of factors um but i think there's a feeling that select committees are not quite as on the uh you know as as, as hot an operation as they were yeah. um sort of in the 2010 2015 parliament a sense of not firing on all cylinders yeah. but they are still places where an effective mp can really make their name yes. you know you get the viral clip of you 
as an MP questioning some villain about something they've done wrong and putting them really on the spot. Now, this can turn into quite gratuitous grandstanding or just chucking around insults if it becomes silly and if the chair lets it sometimes chairs have to sort of calm things down a bit but it can also be a moment where you can really put someone on the spot and uh, get a lot of attention for yourself as a member of parliament and of course attention is one of the currencies of parliament yes and the other bit that uh, the the right committee came up with was the idea of having an e-petition system for parliament a way of getting concerns from outside of the parliamentary sphere altogether before MPs get an answer from ministers. I mean, partly modelled, I think, on the fact that the Scottish Parliament, when it was set up, created a, a quite effective petitions committee, and uh, MPs down in Westminster began to look rather enviously on its activities, and, and now we have uh, a petitions committee that's really quite a big part of the parliamentary ecosystem. Yeah, and, and at the time, of course, there was the number 10 e-petition system, but those petitions didn't really go anywhere or nothing was achieved off the back of them um, and essentially what uh, was proposed was sort of bring those in as a parliamentary petition system and and link them to parliamentary proceedings so that they could be considered that there could be a response um, and it took quite a while for it to be sort of bedded in um, I mean it was still effectively run run by the government but whilst being a parliamentary process initially and in fact the Hansard Society was involved with the Backbench Business Committee with Natasha Engel's committee in trying to broker uh, effectively a deal with um, the then leader of the House uh, of Commons office uh, the government digital service and the, the the Backbench Business Committee because at the time a lot of these e-petitions that were breaking through the, the, the threshold the thresholds the signature thresholds for for debates were not getting actually debated because the government had, had got control of the timetable, the agenda, um, and it decided when debates would be scheduled. And so the Backbench Business Committee hadn't got you know control over that process. And the other thing that was happening was that a lot of these petitions, because they were very popular, you know, they were organised media campaigns, particularly from, from um, outlets like the Daily Mail, that were driving some of these e-petitions. But the government had access to the data of who these petitioners were, Parliament didn't. So there was a problem, how could the Backbench Business Committee and MPs communicate with the petitioners when they didn't have access to the data? So it was all a bit of a mess. And what I discovered to my, to my shock was that Natasha and, and George Young had not sat down in a room together to discuss this at any point. You know, they sort of been talking past each other. And I was asked to, in the society, if we could broker a discussion round the table and get everybody involved. And we were acting as a sort of convener, honest broker. And we produced a paper out of this you know, seminar that took place one lunchtime. Um, and a lot of the proposals that emerged out of that discussion were subsequently implemented then by the Procedure Committee, recommended by the Procedure Committee of the House of Commons, and then emerged in the 2015 Parliament with the Petitions Committee, which is the model we've got now. So it did work, but it took some time to, to, to get there. So that's turned into quite an important part of the workings of Parliament. Very quick last one for you. To what extent are written parliamentary questions performative? This is someone called Martin Thompson. The answers are so often cursory following edits by SPADs, that is Ministerial Special Advisers, that it seems their only purpose is to raise a flag with constituents and ministers that an MP is taking an interest in a certain topic. There seems to be little scope in obtaining substantive answers with such perfunctory replies. Well, I'd agree with him on the point about perfunctory. I think they often are. I think actually the quality of the responses has been, has been declining. Um, I think you read some of them and you think, you know, really? That's the best you can do? On the other hand, you sometimes look at the questions and you think actually that is something you could have Googled. Yeah. Um, you know, there are an awful lot of MPs uh, and MP staff putting in lots of written questions, and, and these have a cost attached to them, um, putting in questions that, frankly, are pretty basic and that they could get uh, they could get through other means, whether that's a House of Commons library or, or somewhere else. So I can understand to some extent that perhaps ministers in the civil service get a bit teed off with, uh, with, with some of the questions. But, uh, I mean, one of the, the issues uh, with them is, is sometimes the, the length of time it takes to get a reply, mm, mm. even if it then turns out to be perfunctory and says nothing. And that's, you know, sometimes you've got such ministerial turnover that you can go through several ministers before yeah. one of them has the time to sign off an official answer. Yeah. But um, and, and I, I suppose the thing here is, is that the machine is, will, will be alerted when it's certain people asking the yeah. questions. I mean, if you yeah. start getting a barrage of questions from someone like David Davis or Stella Creasy 
then you start to think, well, what case are they trying to build mm. here? What's, what's going to come out? What are we going to be ambushed with later on? So some people will, will attract a lot of attention when they ask questions, but as you say, a lot of them are performative. And the other thing is, this is an election year, and the opposition will be using this to try and get some intelligence and some data and some statistics that they can use in the, in the campaign to come. <laughs> Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. Please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. Well, what do I know about algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting hansardsociety.org.uk slash PMEUQ. We'll be discussing them in future episodes, including our special Urgent Questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about Parliament. And you can find us across social media at Hansard Society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the Hansard Society. Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash PM or find us on social media at Hansard Society. Hansard Society.